Hi guys, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of The Walking Dead, season eight, episode 13, Do Not Send Us Astray. But uh, by all means, please do send Henry astray. You know, just right into the woods, off you go. Poof, you know, you guys did it with Heath, but in this case, no one would miss his freaking kid. <sighs> another thrilling battle, another pointless subplot that undoes everything. That is life on The Walking Dead, I guess. Now, sure, lots of stuff confused me this episode, as I'm sure it did for you. But you know what? Let's break everything down and unpack and explain everything that can be unpacked and explained. There were some interesting details for series that uh, might give this episode a whole new meaning for you. And let's start with the big question brought to us on Twitter by Jim. What is it that Morgan supposedly knows? Now, Jim is referring to ghostly Gavin's haunting taunts at Morgan. You know what it is! Now the answer of course is black and yellow. Next question, nah, for real. Uh, let's talk about this episode's ending. Throughout the episode, Morgan is visited by a hallucination of Gavin who repeats uh, phrases, you know what it is, and you were supposed to. Now on the surface, this is Morgan's own subconscious telling him that he was supposed to execute Gavin, not the little young Henry. And now he's feeling guilty for his violent insanity, his clearness, inspiring the same sort of blind vengeance in the younger generation. But on a deeper level, this episode itself kind of tells us what it is. Uh, the final three lines of the episode are Gavin screaming, you know what it is, you know, followed by Diane asking Maggie, what is it? And Maggie, watching her people get buried, responds, the cost. And if you look closely at these scenes as part of a larger meta conversation, you get your answer. It is the cost, the cost of selfish, vengeance-driven decisions. Maggie admitted that she brought the battle inside the hilltop walls so that Glenn's grave would be the last thing Negan sees, a move motivated by vengeance. The cost of that? Well, she made it easier for the savior's walker blood covered weapons to infect more of her people. Rick admitted to Maggie that he went rogue and T-boned Negan trying to finish him off alone. He was motivated by vengeance for Carl's death. The cost of that? Well, Negan got separated from his pack, allowing the more bloodthirsty Simon to take the lead and depriving Maggie of that justice that she wanted. And Morgan reacted to Benjamin's death last season by reverting to his psychotic killing streak, using his new sharpened spear to slaughter savior after savior while clearing the kingdom. The cost of that? Well, dumb dumb Henry follows in his footsteps, letting blind vengeance guide him into making the idiotic decision to open the prisoner gate and allowing saviors to easily overpower him and escape. So that's the general idea here, guys. When tragedy strikes and you lose someone, do you react by seeking vengeance and doing things just to make you feel good in the short term? Well, there's a cost to that. Usually it means even more violence and unnecessary loss of life. But all of this connects to the deeper meaning of the episode, which I will get to at the end of this video. But for now, there's actually a second big question that a lot of you guys have asked about, including Jordan on Twitter. Is Tara infected? During the battle, Simon was creeping up on Tara, but Dwight shot her in the shoulder with an arrow before Simon could get there. This was all overseen by Daryl, who interpreted it as Dwight betraying them, showing his true nature, whereas uh, Tara was with it for some reason? It's weird. It's kind of like Daryl and Tara kind of knocked their heads together and swapped outlooks all of a sudden. Everyone's conclusion was that because Tara got a flesh wound by a savior weapon, she would turn just like everyone else did. But maybe not. Before the arrow was fired, Dwight turned down the chance to kill Tara, leaving it to Simon. His decision to shoot Tara in the shoulder only really makes sense if Dwight actually wanted to spare her life. Unlike the other saviors, we never saw Dwight soak his arrows in Walker blood, and considering his dual loyalties, there's reason to believe that arrow was actually clean. And yes, I know this whole question of whether or not Walker blood can really infect people without them getting bitten is a little confusing, considering season two revealed that everyone is already infected, and that over the seasons, pretty much everyone at some point on the show has probably gotten Walker blood in their mouths or in open wounds. Anyway, check out my breakdown of episode 11 for more details on this whole topic, but Tara's situation here makes more sense if you compare this episode to the comics, but it's uh, kind of a spoiler, so if you don't want to know, skip to this time so you don't get mad at me for spoiling things for you. Okay, uh, this episode was adapted from the events of issues 123 and 124 in the comics. Much of the battle came from the art of those panels, including the move to suddenly blind the saviors with floodlights. 
But that battle ends with Rick getting shot with Dwight's arrow, causing a scare that Rick would be infected and turn into a walker. But then we learn that Dwight's arrow was actually clean and that Rick is okay. It's one of the primary ways Dwight proves that he can be trusted. This show could be adapting this storyline with Tara. She and Daryl, more than anyone, still hate Dwight. So if they learn that this arrow is clean, that could be a big turning point for them. Now, I'll say that if the show plans to use this whole clean arrow twist on Tara instead of Rick, that would change the way we look at that mysterious closing shot at the end of episode 9. If not from Dwight's arrow, why is Rick wounded? I still predict this moment is following a final battle against Negan, but something else would have had to have caused this uh, gut shot. Let me know what you think in the comments below, but for now, let's move on. Speaking of Dwight's uh, arrow hitting Tara, it's interesting that it's the same way that Dwight killed the person Tara is avenging, Denise. Let's look back at the other ways this episode connected to past episodes in our section, callbacks. Now, Tara's forgiving attitude this episode is due to her suddenly remembering her own past as a turncoat. She and Daryl discuss how she used to be with the governor and how she really benefited from their people allowing redemption. They also bring up Merle, Daryl's brother, who was with the governor as well. Now, I thought it was interesting how Daryl admitted that if not for Rick, the two brothers probably would have ended up with the saviors. Just like how we saw with Morales earlier this season, all of these survivors could have easily ended up in a plundering cult in a slightly different series of events. This whole episode seemed very aware of that past prison era. This episode's nighttime internal outbreak very much echoed the season four episode Infected, where the sickness caused chaos throughout the prison. And Morgan's hallucinations of Gavin certainly echo the season five episode when Tyrese hallucinated the ghosts of Beth and Mika and Lizzie and the governor. We saw the death of Tobin this episode, so it makes sense that these scenes would remind us of the last time he was really important on the show. Carol tells him, sorry for how I left. She's referring to that time they dated. Hey, remember that? That was in season six when she uh, broke it off with him with that goodbye letter. This episode also continued two time-honored traditions on The Walking Dead. First, the bizarrely high death rate of doctors on this show, which I've compared to in the past to the uh, Defense Against the Dark Arts professor job when it comes to turnover. We've seen the deaths of Dr. S at the prison, Pete in Alexandria, Denise, Dr. Emmett Carson in the sanctuary, and his brother Harlan Carson recently, and now Dana, the kingdom's doctor. The show is going out of its way to clarify that Sadiq is the only person left in the world with any medical training. I guess there's that uh, Dr. Stevens guy back from the hospital in season four. He's probably around somewhere, but Sadiq probably killed him, right? Because this is The Walking Dead, and doctors are Highlanders. There can be only one. <laughs> the second tradition is Carol's terrible relationships with children, right? There's Sophia and Lizzie and Mika, Sam, and now Henry. Every kid who even looks at Carol drops dead. Which, uh, yeah, that's my prediction for where Henry is, by the way. When an episode ends with Carol looking for uh, a kid, the most plausible guess is that the kid is dead inside a barn, right? All right, moving on to quick details that I want to point out this episode that I found interesting. A lot of you were confused why the doors and windows were left open at the hilltop for walkers to just kind of walk in and spread the infection. Well, in the scene with Rick and Michonne, Rick explains that they need to open up everything so the rooms crowded with Kingdom and Alexandria soldiers don't overheat overnight. Yeah, that makes sense, but you know, it also would have been smart to keep a guard awake overnight, right? You know, to wake up everyone when walkers start attacking them or loudly falling down stairs right next to them. Mm. Well, you may have also noticed the recurring close-ups of clocks this episode. There was the grandfather clock when Henry stole the gun, the digital clocks on the bedside beside uh, Tobin and Dana's wristwatch. The director used these to convey the hours passing as the infection took hold, but on a deeper level, this imagery combined with the subtle ticking sound effect and the music of the episode created this tension as if uh, time was running out for all these characters. Let's also talk about some of the ways this episode drew on cultural influences in our segment, Under the Influence. I love the way this episode showed us a shot of the full moon right before Tobin's death and turn. They used a classic horror movie trope for werewolf mythology, the visual signal warning of a human's coming supernatural transformation. And I thought it was also interesting how Simon's response to Maggie regarding the savior prisoners was that his organization prizes people who avoid capture. Now, in real world war, leaving a man behind is at best a last resort. It's almost unthinkable because it completely demoralizes your troops. If your ranks realize that their lives mean nothing to you, they lose their will to fight. So for Simon to brazenly declare this abandonment as a sort of like principle or rationale, it's a terrible idea. 
It's not that surprising for Alden and a few other saviors to break ranks like they did. And if uh, Simon glibly saying he prefers people who don't get captured reminds you of any other real world leaders, uh, hopefully neither of those leaders will be in charge much longer, right? And in case you were wondering, Sadiq's prayer for the dead that he tells Rick about is actually a real Muslim funeral prayer. It's a, um, really a prayer for the mourners themselves, that they honor the deceased person's memory and not lose themselves in grief. And that brings us to the deeper meaning of this episode, titled after a line from Sadiq's prayer, Do Not Send Us Astray. In this episode, several characters were led astray by their grief for lost loved ones. Maggie by Glenn, Rick by Carl, Morgan and Henry by Benjamin. And that led them to make brash decisions that led to unnecessary losses. The cost of learning the wrong lessons from those deaths and letting vengeance take over. This episode's first half showed Team Rick and Maggie well prepared for a savior attack. A solid horn alarm system, an effective spike strip, Daryl cleaning up with his dope handlebar mounted machine gun, and a hilltop booby trapped with a ramming bus and blinding floodlights. But Gavin's ghost reflected the nagging flaw in each of their minds, the bloodthirst they can't shake. And as their battle plan fell apart, their own desires for vengeance sent them astray. And let's check in with this episode's kill count. Unlike previous two episodes, there was a lot of bloodshed this episode. Bullets flew and dozens died on both sides. But from my count, Daryl was the deadliest. Uh, he had at least nine kills, saviors combined with walkers. So here's my question for you guys, actually. Who do you think has been the most frustrating character to watch on The Walking Dead? Over the years, characters like Tara and Spencer, Andrea, Gabriel were, uh, very good at driving us mad with their back and forth behavior. And to be fair to the actors, most of this is just kind of like inconsistent writing. This episode, I just cannot get past Henry. Guys, two episodes ago, Morgan told him that Gavin killed his brother. And we thought it was done. We we're good. We we're ready to move on. Now, I get that Henry might not have believed Morgan, but when did Henry ever vocalize or convey this skepticism? It just came out of nowhere. And where the hell did he get the key to open the prison gate? Ugh, look, I'm serious. Wherever Henry disappeared to, just leave him there. Don't make it so easy for the haters to hate on the show, right? Okay, now, but I wanna know what you guys think. Comment down below, tweet me directly at EA Voss, and follow New Rockstars on Twitter for updates on our videos. And yeah, like this video and subscribe to this channel for all of our Walking Dead coverage, and definitely go check out my breakdowns of all the past episodes this season for all the explanations of the stuff that you missed. Guys, thanks for watching, see you next week, bye.